introductions, it's now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On September 22nd, the Premier of Ontario told Evan Solomon that skyrocketing hydro costs were, and I quote, worth it. Is it worth it that this government forces people to choose between heating and eating? Is it worth it that there's 567,000 households that are behind their hydro bills? Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell the families who can't put food on the table that these prices, using her words, are worth it? Can she say it is worth it for the people that had to sell their homes? Can she really tell the people of Ontario that this mess she has created is worth it? Thank you. Premier. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, what, I can, uh, what I can say to the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is that it is absolutely imperative that we make sure that people have the supports that they need so that they can uh, pay their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, the changes that we, the changes that we are making uh, to make sure that there is, for example, the Ontario Energy Support Program in place, Mr. Speaker, the removal of the debt retirement charge from the bills, Mr. Speaker, and the changes that that we've made most recently uh, that we announced in the throne speech, so the removal of the uh, provincial portion of the HST, the additional 12%, uh, Mr. Speaker, that means that rural and, uh, and northern communities have access to 20% reduction, Mr. Speaker. All of those are an acknowledgment of the fact that the improvements that we've made in the system, the fact that we have invested in the system has a cost associated yes, with it, Mr. Speaker, and we understand that we need to help people to, uh, to deal with those costs every day. Mr. Uh, Speaker, back to the Premier. I'm bewildered when the Premier talks about improvements because no one in the province of Ontario has seen improvements. You know, I was recently in Kakabeka Falls in northwestern Ontario and I stopped by Adina Foods. I chatted with the owner there and he had a question for the Liberal government that he asked if I could ask the Premier directly. As a small business owner in northern Ontario, he wanted to know how he's expected to pay his hydro bill and staff with $13,000 as his monthly bill. Mr. Speaker, are those hydro bills worth it if a business is struggling to meet their payroll? This is a question of whether he can continue to actually keep his staff for a local business that is previously successful. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, is her hydro mess worth it if it means that businesses are going to have to close? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, um, it's, it's exactly why we are expanding the, uh, the ICI program, Mr. Speaker, so that smaller businesses can take advantage of the opportunity to reduce their electricity bills by up to 34 percent, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to give the, the uh, member opposite some examples of businesses uh, in the next supplementary, but, Mr. Speaker, that is precisely why we're expanding that, uh, that uh, conservation initiative, the Industrial Conservation Initiative. I'm receiving signals that we want to continue going down the road that I didn't want to go, and I will. Um, this will be my last. And I don't need your help either. This will be the last time I have to talk about warnings. I'll just in introduce them right away. Expanding that program, and Mr. Speaker, is it worth it to kids who have asthma to have clean air because we shut the coal-fired plants? Is it worth it to communities that have unreliable energy to now? I'm now moving to warnings. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Carry on. Because we invested in more than 10,000 kilometres of line that they have reliable power. Yes, Mr. Speaker, it's worth it to have no smog days and to have a system that is 90% clean and has been That's rebuilt, it. Mr. Speaker. It's worth it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I, again to the Premier, what we hear in the government's talking points is reliable power. That's their defence for having this extraordinary disaster of an energy policy. So let's talk about their defence. Let's talk about reliable power. All you have to do is look next door to Quebec. In 2015, Quebec had three power outages that result. Can you stop the clock? The Minister of Housing is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, Quebec had three power outages that were a result of either faulty equipment or human error. Ontario had 32. 
Total outages in Ontario equaled 11 and a half days. In Quebec, it was only six and a half hours. Ontario has had as many outages as BC, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and Alberta combined. We don't have reliable power in the province of Ontario. We have the opposite. Our hydro system is both unaffordable and unreliable. Answer so a direct question. question to the Premier. How, how dare you say we have reliable power in the province of Ontario? You have created a mess. Why won't you apologize to the people of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the uh, Leader of Opposition's question because perhaps the Leader of the Opposition should not be so quick to choose who he compares our province to, Mr. Oh. Speaker. He claims that Quebec hardly experienced an outage at all last year, but just two nights ago, 150,000 residents of Gatineau lost their power during rush hour. The outage was triggered by a substation transmission failure, Mr. Speaker. It seems like that Ontario and Quebec are not immune to occasional unforeseen events, and luckily we have the hard-working power workers' unions that work in both of our provinces to quickly remedy these outages, Mr. Speaker. But I know the oppositions have begun to make these truly bizarre claims about dump trucks hitting poles and, and weather with, you know, knocking down wires, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to hear the plan from the Leader of the Opposition how he can control car accidents and the weather, Mr. Speaker, because he has no plan for anything else. He must have a plan for that. Any question? Order, please. You're on W, by the way. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier's Minister of Energy said yesterday that this government has been tasked with finding ways to bring bills down. The minister said he is going to save families $2.45 by cancelling the next round of renewable contracts. But in fact, he is not saving them a cent. He's just not going to raise prices. The definition of a saving is a reduction. No one is saving anything. Did I save $25,000 this morning by not going out and buying a car? That's not how savings work. The government's logic is completely faulty. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier come clean? Will she admit that this latest PR stunt won't save families a, stunt, a, a cent? So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we inherited an electricity system that had been badly neglected under the previous government, Mr. Speaker. Um, families and businesses across Ontario couldn't count on the electricity system, Mr. Speaker. It was dirty, Mr. Speaker. We shut down the coal-fired plants. It is 90 per cent clean, renewable energy now, Mr. Speaker. So, by the elimination of coal, Mr. Speaker, we've avoided about $4 billion in health care and related costs. So, Mr. Speaker, I think that kind of savings, that is direct savings to the, uh, the people of the province. So, Mr. Speaker, we have made uh, we put in place initiatives to help people to deal with their bills, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's the Ontario Energy Support Program, whether it's the removal of the uh, provincial portion of the HST, whether it's the removal of the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker, all of those Answer. are uh, initiatives that will help people and businesses to deal with their bills. We're further moving, Mr. Speaker, to take costs out of the system that will mean that there will future, be future cost avoidance. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. And don't get me wrong, Mr. Speaker, I do applaud the government for finally realizing these renewable contracts that they signed were reckless and, the be and not in the best interest of Ontario. But, but the question, Mr. Speaker, is why did it take so long for this government to realize it? Is it because they milked 30 of these renewable energy companies for over $1.3 million in donations to the Ontario Liberal Party? It is clear these contracts were never what was in the best interest of Ontario. It was all about what's in the best interest of Liberal coffers. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is now that the Premier has acknowledged these renewable contracts for energy we, we, we couldn't use, had to give away to Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan, now that she's acknowledged that was a mistake, will the Premier consider Question. apologizing to the people of Ontario and giving back the $1.3 million they took from these companies and helping Thank families out with their hydro bills? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, I find it reckless, Mr. Speaker, that we have a party reckless. talking about energy with no plan. I want you to think, Mr. Speaker, just a few years ago, we had to send warnings out to let people know that if they went outside, they would have difficulty breathing, Mr. Speaker. Breathing, Mr. Speaker. The simple act of breathing, it was difficult. But we've got a party on the other side that doesn't want to invest in that. They left a crumbling system, Mr. Speaker, for us to pick up. The 2013 long-term energy plan had forecasted some costs, Mr. Speaker, and we made sure that we're removing those costs. They may ridicule $2.45 for, for families. That is important, and I will find $0.50 cents or $50, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we continue to help families, not just sit there and make up mistakes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. you see it, please? You see it, please? Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to ask the Premier again this question. I hope this time I can get an answer, answer not you. passing the buck. Pass the reality is the government has acknowledged, has acknowledged that these contracts were reckless and unnecessary. The government has admitted that mistake. So my question is, given the fact the government has received, the Liberal Party has received $1.3 million in donations because of these contracts that were a mistake. And also given the fact the Auditor General has said that we are going to overpay, I hear this, $9.2 billion because of these contracts the government has now acknowledged was a mistake. $9.2 billion Ontario is going to overpay. Liberal Party gets $1.3 million. My direct question to the Premier, and I hope she will answer it. Please. Will she apologize to the people of Ontario for taking $1.3 million to the Ontario Liberal Party and causing Ontario to overpay on hydro by $9.2 billion? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In terms of renewable energy, our government is very proud of the electricity mix that we have in this province. 18,000 megawatts of renewable con renewables contracted or online. Ontario ranks first in Canada for installed wind capacity, more than 40 percent wind, Mr. Speaker. But when we're talking about fundraising, Mr. Speaker. Um, order. I, uh, just reminding everybody, the warnings are still on the table. If you get a warning, the next one's out, and I'm still standing, so therefore some people making comments on the government side is not helpful when I'm asking them to come to order. So everyone come to order. Finish, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope I have enough time to rhyme off the long list of the events that the Leader of the Opposition has done in fundraising over the last little while. Uh, at the Albany Club, $10,000 per person. Uh, guests with the wow. PC Health Critic, uh, and uh, that's $500. At the Metro Par uh, Toronto Convention Centre. Come to order, please. Start the clock. New question. Deputy Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For three days, New Democrats have asked a very simple question and have yet to receive a clear answer. Is the Premier planning on helping the sale of Toronto Hydro? Yes or no? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, if the member opposite wants to speak about uh, Toronto Hydro, he will have to speak to the Mayor of Toronto and the Councillors on the City of Toronto, City of Toronto Council. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just over two years ago, our leader, Andrew Horvath, asked the Premier about the sell-off of Hydro One. Now, the Premier said, and I quote, it must actually be very hard for the leader of the third party to ask these questions. She knows that we're not selling off these assets, end quote. Well, of course, Ontarians all know that all the while, the Premier was, in fact, working on the sell-off of Hydro One. So now, it's very understandable that people are concerned with the next moves. 
The Premier is leaving the door wide open to selling off municipal hydro utilities. And people are worried that, yet again, the Premier is not telling people what's actually going to happen. So, does the Premier understand how people are worried that she's planning to help the sale of more of our hydro system? Minister of Infrastructure is warned. Premier. Let me just uh, repeat, Mr. Speaker, that uh, if the member opposite wants to speak about uh, the City of Toronto or other uh, municipalities, Mr. Speaker, he's going to have to talk to the elected officials in those uh, in those communities, Mr. Speaker. That's the way it works. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, we all know, and the Premier ought to know, that the province has a large role in this, and they can actually assist or not assist in the sale of local utilities. So New Democrats are again asking a very simple question. Is the Premier hoping to distract from her decision to sell off Hydro One by helping to privatize local utilities like Toronto Hydro? Mr. Speaker, the fact is that there are other municipalities in Ontario that have uh, made decisions uh, like this. They have done that on their own, Mr. Speaker. And if the member opposite wants to talk with the municipality about uh, about uh, their uh, their decisions around electricity, they'll have to go to their mayors, their councils, and have that conversation. Yeah. Thank you. New question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's deja vu all over again in Ontario. In October 2014, people wanted to know if the Liberals were going to privatize Hydro One. After all, it was privatizing Hydro One, that, something that they didn't ran on, it wasn't something that they mentioned in their campaign, but the government wouldn't give a straight answer. Fast forward to today, and Ontarians saw a throne speech that didn't say a word about the Liberal provincial government assisting local utilities in privatizing. And now, Liberal insiders are saying that selling Toronto Hydro is, quote, a good idea and Queen's Park is interested in helping make it happen, end quote. And just like in 2014, the Premier is dodging this very simple question. Will the Premier be honest question. with the people of Ontario? Are the Liberals planning to privatize more local utilities, yes or no? Let me just say to the, uh, to the member opposite, I'm being very honest with him and with this legislature and the people of Ontario. Those decisions are decisions that local councils have to make, as has happened in other parts of the province where local councils have made decisions around their distribution companies, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the local communities are going to need to make those decisions, Mr. Speaker. If the member opposite wants to talk about the building of transit and transportation infrastructure in the province, Mr. Speaker, and how there is a, a build going on across the province, whether it's roads and, roads and bridges or whether it's transit all across, uh, all across our, our urban centres. I'm happy to talk about that, Mr. Speaker, because we know how important it is that we make those investments, that we create those jobs in the immediate term and, and foster the economic development going forward. If the member opposite wants Answer. to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about that, Mr. Speaker. So, thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Local municipalities will certainly make decisions, but those decisions will be influenced if they know that the provincial government wants to assist them in privatizing those utilities. So that's why the question is here. Two years ago, the Premier denied that she was privatizing Hydro One. Today, the Premier isn't denying that she's planning to help the municipalities sell local hydro utilities. Ontarians are worried. They've been let down by the Liberals before, and they're worried they're going to be let down yet again. Will the Premier just clear the air once and for all and tell Ontarians, is she going to help privatize municipal hydro utilities like Toronto Hydro and the many others around this province? Thank you. Premier? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very honoured to be able to stand and answer the, uh, the member's question when it comes to uh, relating to Toronto Hydro. That is totally a decision for Toronto City Council. And I know um, the other member is contemplating running for other offices, so he's interested. He may want to consider running for Toronto City Council, and he can be part of that decision, Mr. Speaker. But until that time, but until that time, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Hydro One. Every dollar realized from our current assets will be reinvested in Ontario's infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and this sale will support the single largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, Mr. Speaker. And I was very proud to be able to announce in North Bay, in Kapuskasing, in my own riding of Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, $20 million 
dollars for infrastructure investments that are truly needed by many of these municipalities, Mr. Speaker, and I'm looking forward to making more of those announcements. Thank you very much. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's FAO report showed that Northern, that Ontario was on the brink, particularly low-income people, people in Northern and rural Ontario are paying more and more for energy. People will be pushed over the edge with the further privatization of Hydro One. Privatizing local municipal hydro utilities will only make it worse. These are real people who can't pay their bills over more than half a million Ontarians are in arrears. Will the Premier start listening to the people of this province, take action and commit to no more sell-off of our public assets and public hydro utilities? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question because it's another opportunity for me to be able to stand up and say, you know what, we've also heard that from the FAO, but we've heard it from the people of Ontario, and that's why we acted, Mr. Speaker. We brought forward our three-point plan with a specific piece in there for 20 percent for northerners and, and rural folks to make sure that they can get that 20 percent reduction on the bill, Mr. Speaker. The unfortunate thing is when we tried to get this bill passed quickly because we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can get the LDCs in place. The opposition voted against our unanimous consent to make sure that we can get this through quickly, Mr. Speaker. And speaking of the FAO, Sure. The, the FAO confirmed that the average Ontario household spends less on electricity than every other province except BC, but we still know, Mr. Speaker, that some families are having difficulty. That's why we brought this program forward. That's why we have six other Answer. programs in place. The OESP program, the LEAP program. Mr. Speaker, we have so many, I don't have enough time to run them Thank all you. off. Thank you very much. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, every day we read about the opioid crisis and how it is killing someone in Ontario every 14 hours. Western provinces have already created a system to track these overdoses in for finding real-time data for the fentanyl crisis. They utilize the data to deal with this drug crisis. However, Ontario is unable to track in real time, and the data they are using currently is from 2014. Speaker, when will the minister put in place a system to track the overdoses and deal with the opioid crisis that's killing Ontarians every day? Thank you. The minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And uh, the fact is that Ontario does have an automated, real-time system existing in, I think, 118 hospitals across the province, and we're actually expanding that to include all the hospitals, which, based on triage, provides us in real time automatically to the ministry and to public uh, health officers if they want to access that data, uh, all data on overdoses, including overdoses that are due specifically to opioids, Mr. Speaker. Now, when it comes to opioid deaths or overdose deaths, it is slightly more complicated, and I'm happy to address that in the supplementary, but I want to reassure Ontarians that, in fact, we didn't need to take the measure that BC did because we already had in place an automated, real-time process through triage at hospital ERs that provides the ministry immediately with yes, that sir. data with regards to overdoses in the majority of hospitals in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Go back to the minister. Speaker, it's interesting that the uh, premier contradicted the minister's claims when speaking to Global News' Alan Carter. She said that Ontario does not have the data the minister claims to have, and they should actually appoint someone to look into the problem. Speaker, even the, min the Premier doesn't believe the minister's claims. Health professionals and law enforcement need the tools to deal with the fentanyl crisis. When will the government get its act together and come up with a plan to deal with this opioid crisis? Sure, sure. Thank you. Minister? Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I was standing about two feet away from the Premier when she did address this with uh, Alan Carter. And that certainly isn't my recollection of, uh, of, of what she did say. But when it comes to, o to overdose deaths, it is important that, that Ontarians understand that there is a process in place, that those deaths it's those which are suspected as well of being the result of, uh, of a narcotic overdose, they have to be referred to the coroner of Ontario. And the coroner is required or has the opportunity, uh, if he feels uh, that it's uh, merited, to actually uh, undertake a death investigation. I hope the member appreciates that there is a time required to undertake that death investigation to determine, in fact, that that overdose is due to a narcotic overdose, Mr. Speaker, and to the specific type of narcotic, whether it's opioid 
shipyard or other. So that process does take a little bit longer. Answer. However, we are working with the coroner and many others. Uh, I hope to have more to say uh, shortly on this in terms of further improving the system that's in place. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Speaker, we expect the Conservatives to attack renewable energy. It's not what people expect from the Liberals, and they have every reason to be disappointed. Bills aren't increasing because energy is renewable. At heart, it's because we're privatizing the energy system. But instead of fixing the problem, instead of admitting that they've made a mess because of privatization, the Liberals are turning their backs on renewable energy. Why are the Liberals abandoning renewable energy and defending privatized energy? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to rise and answer the question from the honourable member. Um, it's very important for me to continue to emphasize that we have 18,000 megawatts of renewables already contracted or online, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, we ranked first in Canada when it comes to installed wind capacity, more than 40 per cent of all wind, and all existing clean energy contracts will be honoured, Mr. Speaker. And since 2003, with green energy as invested billions of dollars from private and sector investment, creating over 42,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. But let's not, you know, let's not forget, Mr. Speaker, that 90 per cent, 90 per cent of our electricity system is emissions-free, Mr. Speaker. And we haven't stopped yet, Mr. Speaker. We still have the FIT program, we still have the micro-FIT program, and we're bringing forward net metering to continue with renewables in this province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'm not surprised the Premier doesn't want to answer this question because her approach is directly contrary to the way she represents herself to the people of this province. The core reason that hydro bills keep going up is privatization. But in stop, instead of stopping the sell off of Hydro One or shutting down the process of helping local distribution companies sell off their utilities, instead of focusing on ensuring that renewable energy is publicly owned and affordable, the government is abandoning renewables. Can the Premier explain why she's defending privatization and abandoning renewable power? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now no one's abandoning anything, Mr. Speaker. We're actually exactly. continuing to invest in more. And so I think the important thing for us to say, Mr. Speaker, is we're committed to renewable energy and we've built a strong track record that demonstrates many of our successes, Mr. Speaker. As I said before, and I'll continue to say it's something we should all be proud of in this province, 90% emission-free. 90% emission-free is our electricity system, generated by diverse supply of generation sources, including wind, solar, nuclear, hydroelectricity. Mr. Speaker, I got to go up and see the Lower Metogamy. 450 megawatts of power coming from um, from hydroelectricity. Mr. Speaker, renewables are a, an important element of our government's plan to close all of our coal plants, Mr. Speaker. We are the first jurisdiction in North America Answer. to make sure that we do not have any coal-fired electricity generation, Mr. Speaker, making it healthier for everyone in this province. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Minister, I understand that you recently were at Princess Margaret Hospital to announce a new round of funding for the Ontario Research Fund. Support for this sector is creating tangible benefits for the people of Ontario. We're seeing this every day in hospitals right across the province. Some of these breakthroughs have the added benefit of creating more effective and more efficient treatment options so that the money that we are saving can be reinvested into research for life-saving advancements. Minister, I know that people in my riding of Kitchener Centre, where we are an innovation leader, they want to know that we're continuing to introduce cutting-edge medical procedures, which are putting us at the forefront of medical research in North America. Speaker, could the Question. minister please tell us more about some recent advancements that were made possible through the Ontario Research Fund? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation and thank Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Kitchener Centre for her advocacy for research and innovation across the province of Ontario, in particular in the region. 
I recently, Mr. Speaker, had the pleasure of attending Princess Margaret Hospital to award a total of $51 million to support world-class studies and the research talent at the leading institutions across our province of Ontario. Thanks to the funding of this government provides for medical research, our scientists are always on the brink of new and exciting advancements. For example, Ontario Research Fund, Mr. Speaker, helped scientists at Sunnybrook Hospital develop high-intensity ultrasound technology that can be used in the treatment of uterine fibro fibroids. This discovery will save Ontario hospitals $35 million annually. Other discoveries made through the same program have helped scientists discover that Answer. tumors can also be treated using high-intensity ultrasounds. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that last year, Sunnybrook scientists were able to breach the blood-brain barrier and deliver it. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, investing in research excellence and supporting the people who are driving our innovative economy is key to developing medical technology that is saving lives and making our health care system more efficient, and in my community, I know it's providing hundreds of jobs. We know that this part is much bigger, though there's a bigger plan to bring health benefits to the people of Ontario and position us as a continued economic leader. The difference between thriving and merely surviving in this very competitive global economy is the priority that we're placing on medical and scientific research. Minister, could you please share with the members of this House some of the recent examples that demonstrate advances as a result of investing in the Ontario Research Fund? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank you for the uh, member from Kitchener and Centre for the question. Mr. Speaker, our government is dedicated to making sure that Ontario is a global leader in medical sciences. Our investments into the Ontario Research Fund have recently yielded significant advances. For example, at the Ottawa Hospital, Dr. Duncan Stewart discovered that the stem cells are able to treat septic shock, a condition with a high fatality rate, Mr. Speaker. Investments into the Ontario Research Fund also helped Dr. Michael Rudicki discover that Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a disease that affects the stem cells, not muscle fibers. Uh, this breakthrough discovery, Mr. Speaker, will help us save people who suffer from debilitating disease. Mr. Speaker, investments into the Ontario Research Fund have tangible Answer. benefits to Ontarians, and that is why our government under the Premier Kathleen Wynne will continue to invest in this fund. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. The question from Leeds, well, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker uh, Sarah Patterson and Jordan Yokowski love their eight-month-old daughter, Everly, and they want her home. Everly needs 24-hour care, but doctors at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario supported her coming home. But the Southeast Community Care Access Centre is missing in action. For four weeks, They've delayed funding, forcing Sarah and Jordan to pay $300 a day for care, now over $10,000 and counting. Monday, the CCAC presented a woefully inadequate plan and shockingly said, take it or leave it. These parents won't sign it, and I support them standing up for this heartless action. It will cost 10 times more to care for Everly at Chio, and it will tear this family apart. Baby Everly belongs at home, Speaker. Will the minister join me and tell the CCAC to do its job and keep her there? Thank you, well, thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. I can't imagine what the parents of this tiny baby are going through uh, right now. Uh, I am familiar uh, with the situation, um, uh, and I certainly do commit to uh, doing what I can to ensure that uh, that family and that young child uh, is able to get the resources that, that she needs to uh, support her uh, in her young life. Um, but we have made and we are making important changes that do enable this kind of flexibility and this kind of support where we've 
We've eliminated the nursing maximums that are able to be provided through home and community care through our CCACs for those most complex patient, uh, patients, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we uh, recently announced uh, more than a million additional hours of uh, PSW support services Answer. through our CCACs and other changes that we're making to uh, hopefully be able to provide this kind of flexibility and, and assistance, and I certainly commit to working with the member opposite. Thank you. Supplementary. Back, uh, back to the minister. The government and the CCAC's self-managed care model forces families to set up a small business. They must get WSIB, $2 million in liability insurance, pay taxes on the funding, even hire an accountant. It's ridiculous, but Everly's parents, they'll jump through the hoops. They just want, in Sarah's words, something that's fair and manageable so we can live life. They're surviving now, but only because of incredible community support. And that's what Ontario's health care system has come to. Families relying on bake sales and coin cans at gas stations. Sarah and Jordan are exhausted, and they're running out of money. And the CCAC, it couldn't be doing less. So, you know what? I'm just going to ask the minister, please pick up Question. our phone and call the CCAC. Tell them to get their act together. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have no doubt that my that ministry officials are working with the CCAC and with CHEO as well. I hope the member can appreciate that there are a small number of highly complex uh, uh, cases across the province. Uh, this, I think he would agree, is one of them. Uh, we need we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to provide the uh, appropriate uh, health care and medical support to individuals. Uh, but I do, you know, I, I I wish the individual, I wish the rather the member opposite had come to me. Uh, specifically to enlist my support. It's unfortunate he has to raise it in this context. Uh, we are working on this case, and I commit to the family uh, that we will do everything possible. Thank you. Your question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, people in my community of London continue to experience higher rates of unemployment than elsewhere in the province. And for Londoners who do have jobs, many still struggle to make ends meet. Their hydro bills are too high, they can't afford childcare, and even people who finished college or university years ago are struggling with student debt. Speaker, the City of London had a great Premier. idea to become a living wage city, $15 an hour. It's about doing better so that more people can have hope and opportunities. Will the Premier follow London and Alberta's lead and increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question. Speaker, when you look at examples around the uh, around all of North America of how governments have treated this issue, Speaker, I think we should be especially proud of what we've been able to do in the province of Ontario to bring in a system that's predictable, that's stable. It was it was given to us on the advice of poverty advocates, of people from organized labor, people from the business community. I think uh, I think we've become an example of how it's done, Speaker. What we've done is we're about halfway through a five-year period before we take another look at it, Speaker. We've got one of the highest minimum wages in the country. Business knows when it's coming in. They can plan for it. And those people that are working at the uh, minimum wage level, Speaker, know that they're going to get a protectable wage increase from time to time, Speaker, every year, actually, not from time to time. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Londoners read this week that one of our own local employers pledged to increase his employees' wages to $15, and it literally changed her life. Living on minimum wage is a reality for twice as many Ontarians now as when this government came to power. Ontarians deserve good jobs. They should be able to build a life, and a minimum wage is an important start. Will the Premier commit today to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks, uh, thanks to the member for the supplementary. Speaker, you have to go back to a time between 1996 and 2003. Ontario didn't increase its minimum wage. Once, oh, you got to be kidding. People who were working at that level simply saw no, no, uh, no increases at that time. We know who was in power then, Speaker. 
What we did is we obligated as a government to look at this in an organized way, Speaker, in a way that was predictable, in a way that was stable, and we came up with a system that I think, Speaker, other provinces, other states Order. are looking at. Um, around the world, Speaker. I think it's a, it's a predictable way of doing things, but it also, as I said earlier, allows for every five years you take a review. So what has that led to people at the minimum wage level in the province of Ontario, Speaker, have earned more than any other jurisdiction in this country over the past few years. Yeah. They'll continue to get regular increases. And, Speaker, I bring this up once again. When the opportunity Answer. was there to provide advice, Speaker, the NDP made not one single submission to that group, Speaker. Oh. Yeah. Question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. I understand that next summer Ontario will host the 2017 North American Indigenous Games right here in Toronto. These games will welcome up to 10,000 Indigenous people from all across North America to the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the huron wendat Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Métis Nation of Ontario. The games sound like a wonderful opportunity to highlight the accomplishments of Indigenous athletes, especially those from Ontario. Can the minister tell us how our government is supporting the 2017 North American Indigenous Games? Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Well, uh, I want to thank the uh, member for Barry for that question. Yes, uh, next summer we are prepared to welcome over 5,000 Indigenous athletes to Ontario wow. to compete in 14 different sports. This is the first time that Ontario has hosted the Games. To bring the Games to Ontario, our government is investing $3.5 million over three years to support the Aboriginal Sport and Wellness Council. Finish, please. A few weeks ago, I was in Hamilton for the announcement of a major partnership between the City of Hamilton and McMaster University to support these games through a new Western Hub. I was also at a similar event at York University in the uh, City of Toronto earlier this year. I am confident that the 2017 North American Indigenous Games here in Ontario will be the best game. Supplementary. I'm excited to hear that our government is supporting this great initiative to showcase Indigenous sport and bring the Games to Ontario. This is also a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of the ex exceptional sports facilities, infrastructure and programs that are a lasting legacy of the 2015 Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. We know that sport is empowering for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth, and that participation in sport gives them self-confidence, resiliency, and generates pride. Can the minister tell us how our investments in the 2017 North American Indigenous Games will benefit Indigenous youth and athletes in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, I thank the member for her Barry for, Barry for her interest in these games. Our investment in the games will support the development of Indigenous athletes, coaches, and mentors. It will build a brighter future for Indigenous youth in Ontario. You know, sport has the power to heal and to improve the quality of life for Indigenous youth. It encourages emotional, spiritual, and physical strength. That's why uh, five of the recommendations in the Truth and Reconciliation report involves sport, including support for these games. For young people, sport has the power to heal, to improve the quality of their life. It encourages emotional, physical growth, confidence, and ambition. We are looking forward to all of the broad benefits that these games can bring to Ontario and to Indigenous peoples. Thank you. No question. The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I'm hearing first-hand accounts from personal support workers about the precarious working and living conditions at some long-term care homes, such as on how in some shifts one PSW is expected to look after 30 or 40 frail and sick residents, it's an impossible, awesome. if not dangerous, task. As Ontario is facing a double demand for personal support workers, there can be no greater priority than improving our PSW workforce so that our seniors can enjoy safety and comfort in the care they receive. 
Knowing this, Mr. Speaker, why has this minister not prioritized providing that job stability and consistency to Ontario's 100,000 personal support workers? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would disagree. We're doing a great deal for our PS. W's across the province. In fact, we were the government that uh, instituted and implemented a minimum wage for our PSWs, where we've also increased the hourly support to our PSWs, that funds that flow directly through the LINs down to directly to the PSWs, a $4 increase over the past several years, a $4 an hour increase to the wages that they are receiving. We're also working with our PSWs on a long-term strategy to uh, not only elevate the profession of these essential health care workers uh, working so hard and diligently and compassionately in our health care system throughout, including in our long-term care uh, homes, but we're working with them. We've developed a, a standardized curriculum, which is now in place, Mr. Speaker. We're working with them in Answer. terms of uh, issues of regulation and professional uh, uh, abilities to make sure that our PSWs are able to practice to the full scope of their ability. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, the minister has to take responsibility for the continued lack of standardized training and regulation of PSWs in Ontario. Instead of looking to the leadership of other provinces like Nova Scotia and BC, who managed to put the safeguards in place and define their PSWs standards, this government wasted 13 years and squandered $5 million on a defunct PSW registry. I say, Minister, the ball is in your court. When will you give the PSWs the plan they so desperately need so they can do their job? Thank you. Minister Cole. Well, Mr. Speaker, so we are developing those standards. We do have a standardized curriculum for PSWs, Mr. Speaker. We're responding to what we're hearing from PSWs, the associations that represent them, organized labour that represents them as well. And we're working very, very hard to make sure that we're putting in place, guided by them and their good advice, the measures, the supports, the training the financial support to enable them. In fact, we're providing uh, many of them with financial support to upgrade their training, Mr. Speaker. So there are a whole set of issues, and regulation is certainly one of them, that we're engaging the sector very uh, vigorously to determine how, on a go-forward basis, we can continue to uh, respect and acknowledge, uh, improve the delivery of services that our PSWs offer. But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker the, the, that work will never be complete, but I think that we have to acknowledge that there have been important gains made for this, um, this important uh, sector within health care. Uh, we will continue to make further Question. The member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The trophy said personal support workers are getting the pay hike that they were promised. But the Ontario Personal Support Worker Association, representing 21,000 members, says that is, quote, incorrect and misleading. In fact, according to the Toronto Star, thousands of PSWs The member cannot do indirectly what she cannot do directly. You will withdraw. I withdraw. Please finish your question. The Toronto Star says that thousands of PSWs have seen their weekly income go down. Can the minister tell us exactly how many PSWs have seen their paycheck go down? And if not, why not? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's ironic because both of the uh, opposition parties voted against the increase in wage for our, right. our PSWs. What has amounted to, and we're hearing, we're hearing the heckling from them now, but the reality is it was this side of the House that implemented a $4 an hour increase to our PSWs. They were some of the most vulnerable members of our society, let alone in the health care sector. They deserve that increase. We provided it to them. You did not. And so, so, so we are working with our PSWs, and that is funds that flow through directly and all the way down to the PSWs in terms of increases. We're also working with all of our health care providers in the home and community sector, Mr. Speaker, to standardize the contracts so that we will be ensuring even more that the supports are there for our PSWs. If we look in, ho if we look in long term care as well, we've added 2,500 more PSWs in long term care homes since 2008. We're working with the sector. We're taking their advice. We're making great progress, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. The question was. How many PSWs saw their paycheck go down? 
I can tell you, Speaker, that it is thousands of them that have seen their weekly income fall, not rise. They are seeing the times with their clients being cut, sometimes down to 15 minutes. People are getting less home care speaker, not more. And it's not just me saying this. We're hearing it from the PSW on the front line. We're hearing it from the Ontario Personal Support Worker Association, as well as being reported in the Toronto Star, the Ottawa Citizens and other papers. When will this government step up, stop cutting the hours of care that families need and make sure that every PSW sees the full wage increases that were promised to them for every hour that they work. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, here's what we're hearing from PSWs across the country, that they appreciate the wage increase and they appreciate the attention that the Liberal government has been providing to them in the complete absence of any leadership, I should add, from either of the opposition parties. Finish, please. So many PSWs have said to me that they have never experienced a government that has acknowledged the importance of their contribution to the health care sector in this province ever. Not the NDP, not the Conservatives that both voted against any wage increase for PSWs. It is shameful, Mr. Speaker. And they stand up now talking about those that perhaps may be affected by this policy. She doesn't Answer. talk about the tens of thousands of PSWs who have moved into a position where they can actually earn a wage which is worthy and responsive to the talent that they bring every single day. Thank you. Any questions? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Start the clock. Your question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, when I travel throughout my riding, whether it's in the north, in the south, uh, I see many new condo developments. Actually, there are many new condo developments across the entire city. Many of my constituents live in condos, and that number continues to grow as developments are built in my riding. Speaker, my Davenport office is regularly asked about what our government is doing to protect condo owners, a question that is not only important to condo owners in Davenport, but to all condo owners across Ontario. Speaker, currently there are 1.6 million people, or 1 in 10 Ontarians, that are living in condos. Just last year, many of my constituents were pleased to see that new legislation was passed providing greater protections for condo owners in Ontario. Can the minister please inform the House on how the Protecting, Ontario, Protecting Condo Russia. Owners Act is modernizing condo law in our province? Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, and I want to say thank you to the member from uh, Davenport for her question, but mainly for her advocacy on condo laws. Congratulations. Yeah, good job. Good job. Our government is committed to modernizing our condo laws. We are doing so by ensuring that the condo industry become more transparent and accountable. My ministry is establishing a condo authority that will provide owners and boards with quicker, lower cost, and less stressful dispute resolution. The Act will also strengthen financial management rules for condo corporations to help prevent mismanagement. We will also establish a second authority that will license condo managers to help provide further protections to owners and their homes. Mr. Speaker, I'm very confident that condo owners will have greater peace of mind knowing that they are protected after making such a large investment. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. For your response, I'm very appreciative of your ministry's efforts to protect consumers in Davenport and across this province. The minister mentioned the creation of two new delegated administrative authorities. One of these authorities will protect condo owners and boards with a modern and efficient dispute resolution system. 
The other will license condo managers and ensure their ability to effectively manage these organizations. Can the minister speak to the creation of these new delegated administrative authorities and how they ensure greater accountability and transparency within the industry? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you again for the member of Davenport for her questions. Uh, the creation of those two delegated administrative authorities will prove to be crucial in establishing greater accountability in the condo sector. These authorities will be self-funded, non-for-profit corporations that collect fees from their regulated industries. Combining these transparency measures and increasing owners' access to dispute resolution, condo owners will develop positive and mutually respectful relationships with their boards. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking concrete steps to ensure that the condo industry is fair to owners and all those involved. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, yeah, thank you, Speaker. A question to the Premier. Premier, when I asked the uh, Transport Minister this spring about significant delays in LRV delivery for the Eglinton Crosstown and the Wardu Ion, I was, of course, brushed off. Since then, it's become clear this government has completely dropped the ball on vital LRT projects, leaving commuters waiting for the train. There were indications last year that Bombardier was struggling to deliver on the Metrolinx contract for 182 LRVs, followed by a series of warning flags government failed to heed. Today, we learned the Premier's finally opened her eyes to alternatives, allowing competitors for the Finch West LRT to include vehicle procurement in their bids, vehicles that were to be delivered by Bombardier. Waterloo's LRT launch is only a year away, and now we have an 11th hour bid opening to replace trains that we've already paid for. Will the Premier tell us why she's failed to ensure her $770 million train deal will actually put trains on the tracks? Another boondock. Thank you. Minister of Economic Premier. Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to respond to this on behalf of the Minister of Transportation. I can tell you that the it's it's not the Premier or it's not the government that makes these decisions. It's Metrolinx, and it's part of their uh, their process as they go through and procure this this work. So, so we re respect their process. We respect what they're doing. At the same time, uh, we recognize that Bombardier is a company that employs thousands of Ontarians here in this province. Bombardier is a company as well that has done very well by this province and done very well by this country. It competes globally. It's a global company. It's one that has had challenges of late, but, Mr. Speaker, we're quite confident they'll continue to resolve those challenges and continue to be a globally competitive company in the future. I would think that the member opposite would want to not want to down, uh, downgrade the, uh, the importance of Bombardier in our economy. Answer. At the same time, uh, we respect what Metrolinx uh, is doing and, and the process they're going through to ensure they get best value for the people of this province. Thank you. Well, uh, back to the Premier. It's important that the government, this government, provides critical oversight for such a large infrastructure project here in the province. In fact, it was the Liberal government that negotiated the terms, and now delays are running right through the entire $770 million, 182-car <coughs> deal. The testing vehicle for the Eglinton Crosstown light rail line was supposed to arrive back in 2014, then it was spring of 2015, and today we wonder if it's ever coming. In Waterloo, Drained there's over. growing concern that when the operator Grand Link is ready to launch and meet its contractual obligations, there will be no trains on the track. <laughs> Speaker, once the track is laid, the clock soon starts ticking on contracted operational costs. What commitment can the Premier provide to ensure that Waterloo residents, who've already paid $92 million through the Metrolinx contract, won't also be paying for a train service with no trains in the station. Stranded at the station. Stranded at the station. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I mean, let, let me respond to that by comparing our commitment to the commitment of the party opposite. We are committed to building public transit. We're making the challenging decisions, including broadening the ownership of Hydro One, to invest in these very important projects. Your leader and your party are nowhere when it comes to infrastructure investments. You're, you're running and hiding on, on the opportunity to create more revenues to put into infrastructure. 
We're investing $160 billion over the next 12 years in infrastructure with absolutely no support from your party whatsoever. So everything we're doing, Mr. Speaker, we're doing because of the, the important decisions that we're making. We would like a little support from the members opposite rather than trying to criticize every little detail along the way. We're too late. New question, the member from Aldoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Premier. People are worried about whether there will be a future for the next generation in Northern Ontario. The Ring of Fire can create good jobs and good lives for people in Northern Ontario. The throne speech, once again, had nothing but a brief mention about the Ring of Fire development, even though the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has asked that it be declared a national priority. People in Northern Ontario have been let down over and over again by this Wynn Liberal government. They are struggling to pay their hydro bills, deserve good-paying jobs, and, and not more promises. When will this government act and develop the ring of fire? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you very much, and I'm pleased to answer the question from the member on this particular topic in, 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 with the uh, Minister of Northern Development and Mines on behalf of the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. The, the member references, in his words, the lack of a reference to this particular project in the throne speech, Speaker. Well, what I can say back to the member is that I remember very clearly the commitments that were made in the 2014 election platform around the Ring of Fire, and the $1 billion that we have attached to the, for this uh, particular project when it begins to move forward. You know what I remember is when the leader's debate was in Thunder Bay and your leader was there, on the day of the debate there was not anything in your platform when it came to committing to the Ring of Fire in Northern Ontario. But the day after the debate, or somewhere around that, at that time, she finally saw the light and decided, well, we need to do what we can. And so an unidentified number was attached. Question. I think the language uh, from your leader was, well, whatever we need, we'll do whatever we need. Really clearly something that your party had not thought about. A very clear commitment from our government Thank on having a fire. $1 billion. Supplementary. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last year, the Auditor General said that in six years, the hand-picked Ring of Fire Secretariat spent $13 million and nothing to show. Your minister's mandate letter, Premier, letter says that work on roads and infrastructure in the region to connect with the future Ring of Fire development would start in 2018. So, Northerners won't even see a Ring of Fire for a decade or more. When will this government have the once-in-a-lifetime Ring of Fire development shovel ready? Thank you. Speaker, you know, I, I know that uh, the member opposite represents a northern community in a northern riding in Thunder Bay, or in, in his riding in northern Ontario, and I would expect that in his questions, and in his knowledge of this particular issue, he would at least attach some importance and make some reference to the significant amount of work that's gone on by the minister and the government in terms of working with our First Nation partners in terms of the ability to advance this project. But on a number of occasions, as the critic for Northern Development and Mines and on this file, he has stood in this place and asked these questions as if that is not a significant component about or regarding to what has to occur before the project can go forward. Speaker, we know that that is significant. You know the minister has done a lot of work in that particular regard. And I would like to say to the member once again, it would be nice if your leader would actually stake out a position and make yes, a commitment sir. on this in terms of what dollars she would attach if she had the opportunity to lead the province to the Ring of Fire in Northern Ontario. I would offer a reminder that um, um, you always refer your uh, questions and your answers to the chair. Uh, when you start getting into a cross, it be, uh, it's, a, it's uh, more confrontational, and I appreciate that. So I'm going to recognize the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, welcome the Mayor of Kenora, Dave Canfield, who is in the East Members Gallery, and Kristen Oliver, the Executive Director of Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, they've unfortunately left the chamber, Speaker, but I do want to welcome from my riding of Burlington, teacher Judith Jenis, six teachers uh, from Ontario and from my community, along with students from the Netherlands, uh, 42 students in all, Speaker, from Appledore and our Twin City in the Netherlands, here visiting the Ontario Legislature as part of a Twin City Youth Exchange. Thank you, Speaker. Welcome to Queen's Park. We have a deferred vote on the motion for allocation of time on Bill 13. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members? On Tuesday, September 27th, 2016, Mr. Nack, we move government notice of motion number one. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Uh, Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalon. Madame Lalon. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry San Muscopa. Mr. Miller Perry San Muscopa. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 50 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. There are no further uh, deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.